We're living in a big condom, basically. Like, you know, we're living in a big ball of bubble wrap. That is not a environment in which sort of you need testosterone. So the body is fundamentally important. Mastery resides in the body. Virtues are an act. They're not something you think about. I think all men should go and learn to fight. Go to the f***ing gym. Like, you know, the body rises to the occasion. You want to fix testosterone? Put yourself in danger. Put yourself in a place where you are challenged. This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today, we got Alex Svetsky on the line. Alex, how's it going? What's up, brother? Thank you for having me on. Yeah, this was uh, a cool kind of connection. We went back and forth maybe on Twitter a little bit. I think uh, found each other. And then, you know, I was like, who who should I get on the podcast? And a couple of friends were like, you need to talk to Svetsky. I was like, oh, hell yeah. And I, I was familiar with, you know, you wrote the you know anti-communist manifesto with with Mark. And I kind of read some of, some of your stuff. And... But then, yeah, took a little deep dive the past couple of weeks and really think align with your mindset. I think our listeners align with your mindset um, pretty well. But I guess for those who aren't familiar with you or your work, maybe give a, a brief introduction how you've gotten into you know the Bitcoin space and, and kind of what you're focusing on right now. For sure, bro. Thank you for the intro. Uh, bit of an overview. So I've always been... Uh, more of the entrepreneurial kind of guy. I uh, I was very academically strong when I was young. I um, I aced everything at school. Went to university as a t- to study civil engineering, basically, and realized I was surrounded by idiots. And I took my scholarship money. You know, I, I say gambling now. At the time, I thought I was a genius making money. Um, I, and and I, m- I made like twenty x on my money initially. Um, and then I sort of 2007, 2008 turned around and I basically lost everything and found myself in a quarter million of debt. And that was sort of what spurred me onto my uh, entrepreneurial journey. And since then I've been building business. I've I've never actually been employed. I've never had a job. Um, And that's really what my general story in life has been. And, you know, I stumbled into Bitcoin in 20, kind of like 2015, 2016. Um, Didn't really get serious about it until kind of late 2016, early 2017. And it was on that journey that I think a lot of my sort of like the the values that had been embedded throughout the years, because I grew up to an, you know, an immigrant family, you know, I had to like, you know, my uncle and I, we, we built houses together. So we're always like working with our hands. I was always entrepreneurial. So I was always like creating stuff. So, so kind of the, the notion of a, of a government or all this sort of stuff always like rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, during my you know years of trading, like I did kind of go down the gold and silver rabbit hole. So in 2010, 2011, I was a major gold bug. Um, and I, I did pretty well out of that, actually. That was, you know, one of my best trades uh, in life. And, um, and, you know, kind of all these like little random puzzles came together. And when I found Bitcoin, I just, you know, it, it sucked me in. And, you know, obviously, particularly in the last couple of years, um, you know, I, I was always a little bit more of a renegade anyway. And you sort of see that in my earlier writings. I think it's funny. I, you, you go back to my early, early, early essays on, on Bitcoin. It's, you know, I, I never really wrote in public before the Bitcoin stuff. I started a random medium in 2015, I think, or 2016, kind of writing more about like my entrepreneurial stuff. But then, you know, you, you see some of my early pieces were a little bit shit coiny. I had like, I discovered crypto, right? And then very quickly, like you see my tone change and I kind of went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Then I found Bitcoin Twitter in like 2018. And yeah, I just, I just quickly seemed to grasp it. It just like sort of what you just said about, you know, reading my stuff, how it aligned with you, like, you know, the Bitcoin ethos just, just aligned with me very well. Was there and, a moment? Yeah, man. I, was there a moment when uh, you realized, kind of, I appreciate this, you know, movement, this technology for you know reasons greater than just making money, um, or is it kind of how did that? Play I don't out? think I can point to a moment. No, not really. I don't think I can point to a moment. I think it was, um, 
it was it was multiple factors, man. Like I, I met some really smart people who turned out to be Bitcoiners, right? Like I started listening to the Bitcoin podcast. So I, I I also like I dug deeper into the shitcoin narratives. Maybe maybe one specific moment was so I I set up a company called Amber in Australia, which was actually the first Bitcoin only DCA app in the world. Like we started, you know, like everyone there, there's a DCA app in the everywhere now. You know, Swan Relay, everybody, right? I, we were the first ones. Uh, and I remember raising money for that in uh, late 2017, early 2018. And people were like, what do you mean Bitcoin only? Like, where's Ethereum? Like, where, where's your, all your other coins? And I was like, no, 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 Bitcoin only. I'm telling you, it's the future. And I just got fucking laughed at by everybody. They're like, this guy's insane. What do you mean a savings app? Like, Bitcoin's an investment. It's not a savings thing. I'm like, no, no, no. It's a fucking savings technology. Like, all this sort of stuff uh, we built. So I think maybe one of my epiphany moments was, before, before, like I, I was really Bitcoin only. I was planning to do uh, a token for my, for my app, kind of like the Binance token. That was my thing. I was like, man, this is fucking insane. People are like raising millions of dollars on these tokens, and like they don't even have to dilute anything in their company. I was like, this is the holy grail of raising money. Like, so I, I remember going away. I don't know if you know a place called Byron Bay. Uh, it's in Australia. It's kind of like a you know, gorgeous spot uh, in the world. And I, I went like I remember printing like twenty white papers everything from like Binance coin to every other shit coin, everything. And I went away and I was like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to like design a token. And I swear, man, like I came back after that weekend and I was like, this is the biggest fucking scam on the planet. Like I like lost 20 points of IQ reading this shit. Like these people are insane. Like how the, how are people giving money to this crap? And just, I don't know, man, just something inside me was like, I can't fucking do this. So, so maybe, maybe, I don't know if that was like the specific moment, but just something there just like really rubbed me the wrong way. So it was like the simultaneous, it was like the contrast between the, the level of intellect and discussion happening in Bitcoin specifically at the time. And it was very nascent, like, mind you, like, you know, it was probably Andreas Antonopoulos. It was like some old Nick Zabo stuff. You know, there, there wasn't like, a breed lover or Gigi or anything at that time. Like that didn't exist. Like Nick Carter had some good early pieces around them, but we were all like nobodies. Right. And, um, I still remember the first, uh, the Bitcoin times edition too. Like I got Nick Carter, breed love, Gigi, all of us together. And we wrote this like, you know, set of series of essays and it's like they're historic pieces, honestly. Um, that was in 2019. And it was like, I, I kind of think about that period, like, 2018, 2019, those two years in particular, where some of the best Bitcoin literature outside of, Zabo and Antonopoulos, like some of the best Bitcoin literature came up in that time, like Seyfedin, you know, his book took off in that time, like Gigi stuff took off, Breed Love stuff took off, like my stuff took off, like all of us kind of took off in that period. And just, yeah, it, it sort of built on itself, like the contrast between what we were talking about, like the philosophy, you know, this broader like humanity, you know, the sovereign individual kind of became a meme around that time, all this sort of stuff happened. Um, and, you know, the shit coiners were talking about like, you know, my fucking yams and potatoes and DeFi and whatever other stupidity that was coming up. So that like really, you know, that, that intellectual power, like I think captivated me. And anyway, to, to sort of tie it back to your original question a bit about me. So yeah, always been entrepreneurial, but I think more people know me possibly from my content because funny enough, uh, I guess Twitter is a content platform. So, you know, you end up being known for, you know, what the platform what the platform pervades. So yeah, that's a, uh, that's a little bit about me. Yeah, no, it, it's quite interesting because I definitely had a similar story. And I, I remember just first kind of learning about like ICOs and I was just very skeptical. My friend was like, Oh, we, we should do an ICO or something like find a way to just raise money because it's that easy. And I was like, well, if it's that <laughs> easy, it just didn't make any sense to me. It was a bunch of red flags and you know, it was, um, just a time where, you know, money was just being thrown around like crazy. So I had that kind of subconscious skepticism, but definitely it wasn't until like 2019 and then 2020 for sure that cemented like, you know, everything is absolute garbage besides Bitcoin or at least like a 99% of things. And it's really interesting you say that as well, because yeah, everyone in the shitcoin space is just worried about, you know, making money or raising money or doing all these things. Whereas when we're just fixated on Bitcoin, we have time uh, to just think about the greater picture of like what matters in terms of, you know, society and adoption. And I think that's a good, you know, point because in 2018, 2019, the rough bear market, I think it allowed a lot of that good information to kind of get out there and, and build a strong foundation 
for you know why Bitcoin is so superior, and then also how this drives you know everything forward in, in many directions, many facets of you know just being more decentralized and sovereign, like you're saying. Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a big delineation there between people that are interested in you know I guess call it a higher calling or some form of excellence or some form of making an impact on the world. Whereas, you know, the other ones um, are more interested in essentially gambling. That, that's really the the delineating yeah. factor. It's like, I, I've got no problem with people going out there hustling, making money and stuff like that. But if it's like a, I don't know, like a degenerate gambling thing, you know, so be it. I mean, you know, the, the devil's advocate position here would be, no, you guys are just fucking coping and trying to like manufacture a reason that you didn't go out there and, you know, make a bunch of money like Vitalik and stuff did. And, you know, who knows, maybe on some fractal level, that is true. You know, we, we are coping through like convincing ourselves that, you know, we're doing this for the higher good or whatever. But I, you know, I, I challenged that notion myself towards the end of last year, because last year was a, you know, wild, rough, crazy fucking year for me. And, you know, a lot of, you know, I had to basically face a lot of demons. And, and one of them was that thing. I was like, man, you know, I, I had a dispute with, um, with the regulators, you know, around the company that I founded. And, you know, I basically did everything right. Um, but, you know, I didn't agree with the regulators on a couple of things. And I had to step down from my business. Otherwise, we're going to lose our license. And, you know, I, I looked at that in contrast to the people that literally, like, in Australia, there was a couple ICOs that, like, raised 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars, delivered zero like rug pulled, took the money, and they are still on the board of the Australian Blockchain Association and they're working with government and stuff like that. So, like, I didn't do any of that and I ended up, like, getting dragged through the mud. Um, they did whatever they want. They literally ripped people off and they are touted as, like, innovators and stuff like that. And I was kind of, like, asked myself, I'm like, man, like maybe I just should have done that. Like, what the fuck did I do with this, you know, Bitcoin stuff? Like, you know, what did I prove in the end that I worked my ass off for five years, you know, built a proper company, um, you know, and the company's still running today. It's just, I'm not allowed to be involved. Um, and in the end, what did I walk away with? Nothing like, um, you know, it just really sort of rubbed me the wrong way. And I, I explored that in my head for a while. Um, and I, and I, and I did a piece like, Towards the end of last year, I don't know if you ever saw my Remnant series. Like they were a bit sort of like this hard-hitting uh, series of uh, essays that talked about like Bitcoin. Like basically, it was like Bitcoin is for the one percent, not for the people. Like it's not for the masses, and the masses don't matter. Who gives a fuck? Like there's the remnant, there's the parasites, and there's the um, there's the masses. And you know, there's this sort of eternal war between the parasites and the remnant, who I would call like the remnant is kind of like the the natural elite, right? Um, and the parasites are always like trying to make, you know, this natural elite feel guilty about themselves. And they're always trying to empower the masses to basically take from that and help in this sort of grand plan of redistribution. Right. And, you know, I think if anything, 2020, 2021 sort of proved to us how gullible the masses are. Like it's very easy to, you know, get people into a state of hysteria because they almost, you know, in crowds and a lot of these people just don't have agency of their own. Um, and anyway, like the the fourth installment of the essay I wrote after a whole year of, uh, of like, you know, my life going by, like the first three, like really uh, put me on the map a little bit that year. Um, and yeah, kind of what, what I posited was, you know, Bitcoin's not about kumbaya, you know, we're going to bring the bottom level of people up and all this sort of stuff. Like, you know, sure, it'll have some impact there, but really what's important about Bitcoin, and maybe this is the this is like a new level of cope, but what's important about Bitcoin is that it makes it so that if you are better, you actually are more likely to get a reward. And if you are a, you know, for lack of a better term, a shit cunt, like, you know, or you fail or you're worse, you know, or you're a cheat, like, because it makes cheating harder. Like it kind of like closes that door, that, that escape valve in, in, you know, the competitive landscape. And essentially the, the outcome of being worse is that you are given feedback, you lose. So, so there's actually Bitcoin like really creates a, a system where there is more clear winners and losers, whereas at the moment there's this non-clarity about who the real winners are, who the real losers are, and like you know you've got this sort of weird escape valve with money printing and covering up losses and like 
politics and all the shenanigans that go in there. And you don't really like the people who are genuinely better are not necessarily winning. The people who are genuinely worse are not necessarily losing. Like there's this like whole obfuscation of the game. And when you think about um, society on this sort of more macro game scale, it's like you want the best people to win. Like at the Olympic games, you want the person who is the fastest to win. Like you don't want, you know, the, the, someone like, there's a reason we don't like cheating in games. Like it's visceral, like it's inside us. And the whole civilizational game at the moment uh, is, is a game of cheating um, and figuring out how you can cheat or be friends with the person who's doing the cheating, which is, you know, the central banks and the politicians, et cetera. So, so anyway, like that, that's, um, I can't remember what my original point was. It was something to do with like, you know, our version of cope. But anyway, it, it, I think it ties back into this idea that Bitcoin is not about um, e- equality in any stretch of the imagination. I think it's the furthest thing from that. I think it's more about uh, hierarchy and excellence more than anything. And and I think that the more I've dug into Bitcoin, or at least matured in the space, is um, that's the draw card for me. Yeah. Um, it's not about helping the masses. It's about helping those who are the best or choose to be the best. Well, it's interesting because I I think, you know, a lot of people say, you know, Bitcoin levels the playing field. And I would tend to, I would say people don't really know what that means because Mm -hmm. if you Mm -hmm. level Mm -hmm. the playing field, guess what? The people who are better are still going to win. So that's, to me, I, I agree with that, but I think most people don't understand what that actually means. And if you've played sports or done anything like very competitive in your life, um, which I have, you know, quite a bit, you realize that at the end of the day, there's always going to be a winner and a loser. There's going to be people who are just more naturally gifted. They work harder. And if you level the playing field, then there will be obvious winners and losers. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. And I totally agree. I yes. th- think it's yes. important because right now the playing field is is so, you know, all over the place, right? Like people have manipulated it. There's so many government interventions. So it's not, it's the furthest thing from level. So obviously, yeah, a ton of people are getting screwed, but then a ton of people who are not, they're kind of, yeah, they're cheating the game are are on top and, and they've stacked their own deck. So just because you level the field, though, doesn't mean that, you know, 90% of society is just going to have a great life. And I think a lot of, mm-hmm. you know, people are going to miss that boat. They're not going to put in the work and they're going to, you know, suffer the consequences of that. But like you said, it's probably all right. And there'll be a hierarchy as a result of that. Hey, friend. Thanks for listening. If you really enjoy this podcast, it would be really appreciated if you left us a five star review on Spotify, Apple, or subscribe to our content on YouTube. This helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education. Totally, totally. And that nuance that you hit there is totally right. As people say level the playing field and they have no fucking clue what it means. It's like that, just that classic trope uh, you know, say it and they just have this imagination fantasy in their head. Like they're, they're almost like, they're like a one step removed from communists. You know what I mean? They're like, Oh, you know, it'll be good for everybody. And it's like, well, you know, that's not the way the world works. And, and like Pareto principles will always exist. There's always going to be an 80, 20, no matter what you try and do. And the more, the more you try and ignore the 80, 20 and the more you try and like distort it, the more it'll actually exacerbate um, in, you know, in a more deformed way, like this, it's like a Streisand effect, right? Like you, you try to ignore the Pareto distribution and you get a even worse Pareto distribution. Like today we don't have 80, 20, we've got like 99.9 and 0.1, right? Like it's just, it's a, it's a fucking deformed Pareto. Um, yeah, it's, it's so bad. And it's easy for us to be a kind of maybe disillusioned on this because we're in an echo chamber, right? Like I'm constantly Mm -hmm. only talking to people who care about their health, who care about Bitcoin who care about, you know, personal responsibility. But when you go out and you have a conversation with normal individuals, normal in terms of like just the average societal member, it's, you know, it's horrifying really. And, you know, I had Matt Hill on the show and he was saying, you know, 98% or 95%, you know, they're just not going to be part of this. They're they're not worth, you know, thinking about. Everyone wants to change the world and bring, you know, people with them. You know, it's a nice thought. But in reality, they're just, they're not going to change. They're a lost cause. Mm-hmm. And um, I think 
the more government intervention or trying to, you know, prop up the the, the lasting bit of the, the monetary system is just going to worsen that. So I think fixating on your core group or and have those strong values will, you know, propel us forward. And it'll be interesting. But I, I'm curious how you see that kind of playing out um, in the you know coming decades, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, so so in the new book that I'm writing, there's a whole section about uh, kind of like three three areas where civilizations have gone uh, either wrong in the past or what we can learn. So so to give people some context, for the last two years, I've been researching and studying for a book that is going to come out at the end of this year called the Bushido of Bitcoin, and the word Bushido comes from uh, sort of Japan and it's you know basically means way of the warrior um, you know or, or way of the militant man so something like that and it's you know the, the closest analog to it is sort of chivalry in the West and you know you sort of had the chivalry in the the Arthurian or the Western knight and in Japan you had the uh, you know the samurai and and sort of Bushido and it was essentially like the concept of Bushido is like a is an unwritten moral code or, or an unwritten uh, code of virtues or list of virtues that um, that those who considered themselves knights or of the knightly class would seek to embody in order to be you know respected and counted as a as a a man of worth or as a as a samurai as someone worthy of being in that class right and you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like the commandments where, you know, you had sort of like a parchment with like, thou, thou must be courageous. Thou must be honorable. Thou, like, it, it wasn't like that. It was, it was more like a, it was a tradition passed down, you know, word of mouth sort of thing. And, and it was, uh, it was focused on virtues, not values. And, and the difference between virtues and values is sort of vir- virtues are more an act, uh, whereas values are more a state, right? So like freedom, for example, um, is, missing in my book. It's not a virtue, uh, but I talk about it as something we value later on. Um, whereas, uh, you know, responsibility is more of a virtue um, than it is a state. Um, and in order to actually acquire freedom, you must act responsibly. So the virtue comes first uh, in order to attain the value. So, so there's a bunch of stuff like that in it. But anyway, the um, in the book, so other than exploring what I think are the 10 virtues uh, that Bitcoiners and I, I kind of say Bitcoiners and leaders of the future, and I think Bitcoiners will fundamentally, due to becoming uh, economically significant in the world, they'll also become socially and politically significant, and therefore have the opportunity to be some sort of leader in the world. Right. So that's the kind of framing that I put there. I don't try and make the argument of why Bitcoin's going to win or how it's going to win or all that shit. I think that's been done by everyone at this point. Right. So. For me, it's like it's it's a Bitcoin culture book, or it's a leadership culture book. It's a book about you know spirit, about courage, about vitality, excellence, and all of that. And um, aside from the virtues, I I go through a a series of chapters where I ask like, look, there's some big fucking challenges to uh, overcome here. It's not just like oh, Bitcoin fixes this and you know everything's going to be okay. It's like no, fuck no. There's there's some big big things that we need to deal with, like questions like does uh, wealth corrupt like that's a big question that a lot of bitcoiners for example don't want to face is like does wealth actually make um does wealth make way for comfort and does comfort necessarily make way for uh weakness both at the individual level and at the societal level Uh, and if that's the case how do we counter that you know when in the same sort of uh sentence we're saying that bitcoin makes us all wealthy like you know could it could it be our own demise so i try and like tease apart that as a concept the other one is this sort of idea of governance is like what uh where does governance fail and i kind of like look at previous uh examples obviously you know rome uh japan uh western europe and like where where things have gone wrong and you know i talk about scale a lot because um one of the biggest problems with governments is not sort of which style matters, but uh, at what scale. And then, you know, 
at, at what scale do you get economies of scale and when do you start getting diseconomies of scale and what are the factors that um, or what are the variables that influence that? And, you know, there's things like it's not only just culture, but it's also like location, temperature, terrain, um, uh, you know, religion, beliefs, like all of these sort of things uh, have an impact. Um, and, you know, that that has a huge uh, effect on what sort of governance structure you end up having for a particular jurisdiction and a particular location. So I sort of tease apart that question. Um, the other one that I talk about in there is, um, is sort of, yeah, culture, culture being a like kind of the, the two things, because it's a book about uh, sort of like the warrior ethos, you know, the shit of Bitcoin. I look at the differences between warrior cultures and civilian cultures, for example. So, you know, you, you'll, you'll appreciate this, I think, and the listeners will as well. Warrior cultures, they uh, they value virtues that are very different to what civilian cultures value. So, like a civilian culture might value comfort. You know, that that's a classic one. It's like you know we buy things. You know we buy the nice lounge or the nice car so we can feel comfortable, right? Whereas, what does a warrior culture value? They lean to they lean into adversity. They lean into pain. They lean into how can I push my fucking body? Like, you know, the, the classic example, you know, modern example is someone like a David Goggins, right? Is like, you know, what's he always talking about? Like pain is the, you know, th- that is the, that is what I'm leaning into. Um, even things like, uh, you know, in a, in a civilian culture, we are more inclined to value individuality. And th- this was a big one for me, particularly having written, you know, the Uncommunist Manifesto like two years ago, I was, you know, talking about individuality, individuality, individuality. In this book, I talk about, hey, there's actually something more important than the individual. It's actually the the tribe, um, you know, like in particularly like, for example, with men, it's the manor bond, like the, the band of brothers, you know, there's the sisterhood of women, there's the family, there's the, you know, the, the local community. And we've lost a lot of this, particularly in the West, because we've, we've kind of uh, drunk the Kool-Aid and become too individualistic in nature. So I talk about how these, you know, different um, – cultural values clash and why, you know, what we can learn from warrior cultures and is there something that we can embed? So I kind of tease apart all of these. And then the fourth big element I talk about is seasons and cycles. And like, is it even possible? Like, you know, the the classic season cycle is the weak men, good times, good times, sorry, weak men, hard times, hard times, good men, good men, um, uh, good times. And like, is it even possible to avoid these cycles? And is it like, you know, if not, what should we be doing? Like, you know, and then I, I, I looked at how everything from the micro all the way through to the macro, like from, you know, the smallest microbiology stuff like goes through cycles and seasons, you know, up through to like just that general season, spring, summer, autumn, winter, through to like the cycle of the planets, you know, the cycle of our galaxy, all, like everything works in cycles. So, you know, I, I sort of like, put forward this idea that's like, look, we're not going to escape this. So what, what actually can we do? And then I asked the question of like, you know, how Bitcoin influences all of these things. And without, without giving too much away, um, essentially I posit that, um, that Bitcoin will have an effect across all of these things, um, you know, with respect to the wealth thing. Um, well, maybe I'll just talk about the cycles because the cycles talk about all of them is that, um, the analogy I use is kind of like a – if you know that winter is coming and if you're unlucky enough that the the stage in which the winter comes, the generation that is coming of age is the one that grew up in comfort, you could be in for some trouble because if you picture a house in winter um, and it's made of wood, well, if you've got like the weak generation, you know, running the household at that time – They'll start pulling the house apart to throw wood in the fireplace to heat themselves up because they want to remain comfortable and they'll literally bring down the fucking house. So if the house is civilization or society, that's what the weak men do in that stage. So what I, what I kind of make the, um, you know, the metaphor is that Bitcoin is kind of like a, a steel framed house. So it's a new material so that the winter is going to come or the generation that is going to be softer men is going to come anyway. We're not going to sort of avoid that at some point, you know, maybe two, three, four generations down the track from us, the monkeys, you know, unfortunately going to come and run the show again. But if the framework is strong enough, like if we've built it with a new material, they're not going to tear the whole fucking thing down. Um, but 
you know, to, to kind of get to there and I'll close the loop here on what, what your original question was is like, we, we are in a, we're in a paradigm right now where, where a particular set of rules works. It's like get in central banking, get into politics, figure out how to cheat, you know, get, get game this, you know, fucked up terrain and win. The Bitcoin standard is a completely different set of rules. It's a different paradigm. It's like the strongest, the best, the most adaptable, the most intelligent, the most hardworking, the most productive, they win. And that's a different set of values, a different set of virtues. Like they're two different playbooks. Where those two playbooks meet is going to be very, very messy. And I kind of, I call it an interregnum. So the, the word interregnum comes from like the period between two kings. So the interregnum is the period that we're going to, going to have to go through. And that's probably going to last a couple of generations until we come out the other end where we are well and truly operating on a Bitcoin standard. And my guess is that that interregnum period is going to be probably the messiest of all because neither value system or neither playbook is specifically the one to go with. Like it's going to be some blend of them. It's going to be transitioning to a Bitcoin standard, but you know, th- there's going to be a lot of scamming, a lot of stupidity, and a lot of crap in the way. So anyway, that, that's a big sort of, Answer to your question is I don't know, but I, I do I do think it's going to be um, wild, crazy, messy. Um, but it's those who can orient themselves for the new standard, for the new paradigm, and maybe set up their lineage to be aligned with that. That I think are going to win really, 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 really big. Yeah, wow, a lot, a lot of great things there. I, I completely align on the virtues over the values, right? I think it's like it's more actionable. Um, yeah, it's like you see people like David Goggins and people get hung up on like motivation and things like that. It's like, yeah, motivation is nice, but guess what? You could be motivated and then just sit on your couch all day. Like you need to go mm-hmm. physically do things. Um, and I think, you know, responsibility, uh, over like freedom, for example, is, is another good example of that it's like, you need to actually put yourself in the situations to build these virtues, um, not just talk about them. And I think that's a big problem online. I think this, uh, you know, stoicism, this uh, masculinity is is coming back with, you know, a strong momentum, which is good. But a lot of it is still, it is where it is. It's on social media. It's written text. And yeah, it's cool to post about Marcus Aurelius, but, you know, these are great men who accomplish great things. And what have you done? Um, I just get kind Mm -hmm. of fed up with some of these Anon accounts that post all this stuff. Totally, bro. Totally. What what have you actually done? (laughs) You know? You You, you built a fucking Twitter account, bro. Yeah. So so it's quite quite amusing. But at the end of the day, yeah, it's going to be this long transition period. And I think I totally agree. Um, I think the consensus among, you know, many many of the Bitcoiner space are, are kind of you know, pretty philosophical forward thinking is that it's going to take a long time. And uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's probably a good thing. It's, it is what it is, but you need to install those virtues in, yeah, your close circle if you want to make it through. And, and yeah, it's all about low time preference. And I, I kind of get sick of you know, a lot of Bitcoiners, yeah, number go up is great for adoption and all that. But hey, it's at the end of the day, like this is going to take a long time to play out. Like, the U.S. empire, the U.S. dollar empire, I should say, is not just going to collapse like overnight. Totally, um, yeah. <laughs> come on. And uh, yeah, it could be chaotic. But it, again, if you have these virtues installed, it's uh, it's it's going to be a lot better for you. But again, I think it's uh, this echo chamber we live in. And I have confidence that more folks will come on board. But again, like 95% are, are probably just going to go the easy route, easy route, uh, the path of, of least resistance. And yeah, the cyclicality, the seasonality, it's funny you say that because uh, on the health side of things, uh, I value this tremendously. I think it's actually probably the most overlooked aspect of, of health, especially if you live somewhere that has a large variance in seasons, which mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, anything above maybe like 20, 30 degrees or below of latitude and, and not in the tropics near the equator. And it's, it's leaning into that, you know, embracing that understanding that it's coming because then you can prepare mm-hmm. for it. But if you're like, you're saying, if you have this strong foundation, for example, the sunshine you're getting in the summer is building this very strong foundation for you to last through winter. So you don't need yes. to supplement. You don't need, you know, to worry about being more susceptible to illness, to virus, to disease. That's the whole point. And if you build that really strong foundation, it's going to carry you through these cycles and then they'll be, you know, less pronounced. Whereas what's going on right now, I think 
we're getting the unraveling of the cycle. So it's becoming more volatile in a shorter period of time, stronger oscillations, but that's going to need to happen to transition. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's so fascinating because it's probably inevitable, like you're saying, mm-hmm. but if we have a bit more you know, foresight, we can be more prepared, hopefully. Totally, totally. Yeah, it's like, I, I, I do think this is... Um, what one other thing I started doing at the beginning of this year was I started reading a little bit of uh, Nietzsche's work and just following some people who dissect some of his work and like I I, I, I don't know it's like I found a kindred spirit um, in in his philosophy and I think um, you know a, a lot of Christians particularly get him wrong um, and then a lot of the you know the idiot armchair philosophers also get him wrong you know they kind of um you know think that he was a you know he brought about nihilism and the destruction of you know god and all this sort of stuff it's such horseshit you know like i think Nietzsche's greatest um contribution was like a philosophy of vitality or a philosophy mm-hmm. of excellence and he and he was really like he, he he pushed that uh hard i think it was you know one of his most central things like he he definitely talked about you know nihilism as a concept because you know he felt it, experienced it, like many of us at times do, but his solution wasn't to, you know, give up on life. You know, his, his call was to become a more vital being. And, you know, he, he more accurately, more vividly than anyone, I I think at least uh, predicted, you know, what he called like the last man, which is, you know, what we would call today, you know, the lemming or the bug man or the masses, you know, you know, kind of like the, the mask wearers, right? Like, you know, who are still on their, you know, going and talking about their eighth booster now, like he predicted those guys and said that, you know, th- this is going to come about as a result of Western civilizations uh, shift towards a mentality of equality instead of quality, right? And I, I, I really try and riff on this in in the book. Is like uh, I'm actually going to write a piece about this um, in Bitcoin Magazine's uh, new po- politics um, edition. So I think this is going to really like ruffle some feathers. But you know the 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 title of the essay is going to be quality versus equality and why equality itself is the greatest evil um, ever to be perpetrated on man. Because, you know, what it does is it, it brings down greatness to, you know, to a level playing field instead of um, creating something to reach for. Right. So, you know, we, we got, we change our gaze from, you know, the stars to like all looking at the dirt, right? Like we, we are all, like our, our vitality is gone, it's it's sunk, and we are downwards facing. We, and it's like sort of like life versus anti-life. Like equality is an anti-life philosophy. Quality is a pro-life uh, philosophy. And I'm, I'm going to try and sort of weave all these ideas together. But um, to, to tie off – oh, fuck, what was my original point? I was saying something in the beginning. I wanted to like make a point here on uh, – Shit. About cycles or yeah, something about cycles, the seasons maybe. Um, who knows? Okay, fuck it. It's gonna have to come back to me. Anyway, going off on tangents. No, uh, yeah, I think I think it's interesting because the whole equality, it's like such an illusion that that's it like is. the best it's way, and it, it's just like inefficient. Again, I mean, drawing it back to like sports or just like a community, right? Like. If everyone's equal, you're not going to accomplish, like you're not going to be your best group of, of individuals. And again, going back to what you're saying, I think is, is important because there's almost this uh, about individualism and then a tribe is that there's almost this transition, at least I've noticed it, right? Like for me, it was like breaking free in 2019 as 2018, I had all these health issues and then resolved them. I kind of like left society and that was very individualistic. Mm-hmm. But then in the past two years, reaching out, putting myself out there, become part of a greater tribe with the same mindset. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and that is way more powerful. And um, obviously, you know, connecting with, with people like you and, and spreading this message. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone has their role, right? Like everyone has their strengths, their weaknesses. So you can't all be doing the same thing. It doesn't make any sense. Just like a sports team, if, if you have, you know, someone who's, who's better at defending, better at attacking, what have you like scoring, like there's always going to be the person who's just the best at their thing. And you have to embody that around like the strategy of whatever you're trying to accomplish around that and, and try and make the best fit, um, cohesive collective group. And that's not equal at all. Um, it's the furthest, furthest thing from it. So I think, uh, it's, it's an even equity or whatever people want to get into the nomenclature. I think, 
at the end of the day that you just need to embrace the fact that, you know, you have your role, you have your strengths and there's a lot of value to be had from trusting people in your community and your tribe to do their role and their strengths instead of trying to be on the same level as them. Totally. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, when you build a car that you have wheels, you have an engine, you have seats, you have a steering wheel, you have like the different part, you have pistons and like all those pieces do something different for fuck's sake to come together as a whole. Right. And that's like, you know, a unit, a tribe or something like that, like a a military unit. Like this is, this is not people who do the exact same thing. You know, there's probably overlap and redundancy. Um, and, but they, they perform a different function. Right. And, um, and, and that's how something functional comes together. Um, and you know, obviously the greater scale, the more individual units that perform perhaps the same function, but there are, there are, you know, units of function, like, and it doesn't just scale up very well. This is, you know, I explore Alexander the Great's, um, story in, uh, in the pursuit of Bitcoin quite a bit. And, you know, one of the things like, I recommend everybody go grab a book by Stephen Pressfield called The Virtues of War, one of the most incredible pieces of literature ever, ever written. And I mean, he basically channels Alexander in some way through this, uh, through this text. Um, and it's a, it's a historical fiction. Uh, so it's, it's a narrative of um, uh, Alexander's life uh, and conquests. And, um, and in there, he, he kind of outlines how some of the battles functioned. And, you know, Alexander with 40,000 soldiers beat what was i mean the the estimates range from 200,000 up to a million uh in Darius aside um which is like anyway from a 5x to a 20x um you know ratio of uh you know in terms of enemy and and the way Alexander structured his army um you know the the micro units um how it was adaptable how it you know fought on the battlefield like to to this day uh it is like the gold standard of a small um of how a small unit can defeat a larger unit because because of that uh, adaptability because of that um change in function whereas the persians were used to you know all the infantry all did the same thing all dressed the same way and you know one rank was like 10,000 people whereas with the macedonians uh one unit was i think it was um i think it was like either nine by nine or 16 by 16. So there were these like micro units and, you know, this sort of modern warfare at the time uh, allowed Alexander to basically decimate uh, his enemies of much larger size. So, so that kind of, that concept uh, scales up, you know, it it, like it, you see it everywhere. Um, You know, a a marriage, like the woman and the man can't do the same fucking thing. Like it's not designed that way. And if they do, not only do they lose polarity, not only do they lose their identity, but, for fuck's sake, like you can't raise a family in that kind of environment. Like who's going to take care of the kids? What a babysitter? Like, like it, the, the shit doesn't work. And, you know, we've, we've lost a lot of that in trying to equalize uh, civilization over the last hundred years. And, you know, the, the West kind of trapped itself. Like, I mean, there's, um, you know, like e- even the, you know, in the, the original declaration of independence or whatever, like, you know, all men are created equal, like, you know, I've, I've come to believe that that's, that's a fucking scam. Like, you know, the West tricked itself um, because, you know, we're not really created equal. Like we, we are all different, like we're different heights, different sizes, different intellects, different DNA, different biology, different parents, different place, different climate, different environment, different culture, different everything. Like we're just not like it's, it's evidently a false claim. Um, and I think ignorance doesn't lead you to a good place. I think ignorance leads you to a place where, you know, you end up making mistakes. You, you end up doing the wrong thing. Um, and, you know, it's not aligned with uh, nature. And, you know, the only way out of that, honestly, is like truth. And sometimes truth is like, it's not pretty, man. You know, it's, it's ugly. Like, and, but if you can face that demon of the ugliness of the truth, that is, uh, you might be able to do something about it. But, you know, if you close your eyes and the dragon's there, it's going to fucking eat you. Um, and yeah, yeah. So, so this, you know, this warrior culture, right. This need for, or I guess this desire for adversity compared to just what we have today. Um, I think a lot of people align with this, but again, looking back historical context, and I think a lot of people look, 
even in traditional you know roles of society and it's nice to take the virtues from that but again today we're in a completely different world we're in a completely different you know situation i mean a lot of wars today are not even fought i mean most most things are not fought at the individual level anymore um, totally, yeah. so how do you apply these <clears throat> principles these virtues into a modern society like what does that look like for for someone you think because i think it's a big challenge right now for for individuals looking back and like i'm saying a lot of people you know look at this stoic you know philosophy they look at traditional family units and it's become really you know popular especially in the health space the bitcoin space but it's not it's not the same you know it's it's different we're in 2023 um there's you know, men aren't, aren't doing what they used to. They're not going to war individually. They're, you know, very few people are, are going out even like hunting or anything admirable like that. So how does that kind of look uh, in the modern lens um, to embody a more of a warrior culture uh, today uh, and progress in this manner? Are you interested in 100% grass-fed, grass-finished bison meat? I'm excited to be a partner with Falls Family Ranches. Based in Wyoming, Falls Family Ranches is raising high quality bison meat the way nature intended. As a native large ruminant of North America, bison is one of the most nutrient dense foods you can consume. If you're interested in trying out their bison boxes, use code TRISTAN, T-R-I-S-T-A-N, 10 for 10% off your first order. Yes, it's, it's, that's a big question that I grapple with in the book and I, I, and I mean, I don't have a definitive answer outside of um, we have to come back to our bodies, right? Like we, uh, you know, another another scam that I try and uh, bring up in the book is this idea of mind over matter. We've been taught that the mind is superior to the body, and that's completely false. Um, you know, at at best, it's mind and body over matter, right? But um, really, like. You know, there's sort of these narratives around like, you know, the Yuval Harari fucking erotic fantasy of being a, um, you know, brain in a vat, right? Like that kind of shit, like this sort of disembodied intelligence um, is false. Like, and and I think that leads us to, you know, a weakened, you know, fractured society. You know, when, you know, when a woman is truly, for example, embodied and in her body, she is far more feminine. When a man is also in his body, um, you he's far more masculine he's stronger right um the more of a distance there is between um you know the body and the mind for example the um the the weaker one gets i mean even when you think about mastery right like i've you know there's a there's a diagram i've got in the book which talks about like how mastery begins like mastery uh, sort of the novice is someone who like has to effortfully consciously try and figure something out. Like, you know, when you first get into a car to drive a stick shift, right, you are thinking consciously about, you know, where's your hand on the steering wheel, how you're moving the gear stick, like when you're putting the clutch in, you know, how much accelerator you give and all this. It's like a, it's a cognitive uh, cerebral effort, like, cause the mind can't manage that. Um, but, you know, as you get better, what happens is it goes into your body. Like there's a body intelligence where, you know, you could just drive practically with your fucking eyes closed. You know where the gears go, you know where the foot, like it, it just becomes natural, right? And and I think a place to start is once again, honoring the body. Like we, you know, we're, we're in a technologically driven society, which once again, like, you know, we're all working on computers, we're all typing, we're all thinking, but we're just cerebrally, cerebrally oriented. And, you know, when people talk about, oh, you know, the, the testosterone, um, uh, the drop in testosterone in the world, like, it's actually pretty normal because we are living fundamentally in a safer world or we're living in a more cushioned world. I shouldn't call it safer, but like, you know, it probably is safer, you know, generally. So, so we're more cushioned, we're more safe. Um, we are more cerebral and like in, in that kind of environment, why the fuck do you need testosterone? Like it's not the plastics and all that stuff. I'm sure that stuff all has an effect, but it's far, 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 far less of an effect than the, the, psychological, basically we're living in a big condom, basically like, you know, we're living in a big ball of bubble wrap and you know, that, that is not a environment in which sort of you need testosterone. So if, if you sort of start with that premise in mind that, you know, the body is fundamentally important, mastery resides in the body. Um, virtues are an act. They're not something you think about. 
there an act, there's something you do, then you can probably ask the question like, what can I do? And, you know, you mentioned one thing like, you know, hunting is one example. I think all men should go and learn to fight. They should go like join a jujitsu gym, you know, you go to the fucking gym, like put yourself in a position where you have to like, you know, lift the extra plate, you know, or do a fucking squat. Like, you know, obviously don't snap your neck doing something, but like you, you need to push yourself. Like I, I used an example one day where I was at this um, little event in Austin and, you know, they were having a discussion about, you know, testosterone and this and that. And I just used the example of like, go to a prison. Like those motherfuckers there aren't getting top tier testosterone and they're jacked as fuck. Do you know why? Because they're always at constant threat. They're always in danger. Like, so the body actually responds. You know, testosterone is something that, you know, is, is our, is our biological way of responding to danger, to threat, to challenge. So, so it rises, you know, the body rises to the occasion. You want to fix testosterone, put yourself in danger, put yourself in a place where you are challenged, not just intellectually, but physically. Um, you know, and, and, you know, recently I've been put, me specifically yearning to, you know, in, in the next year or two, like I'm 100% selling some fucking Bitcoin. I don't give a fuck. I am buying some land and I'm going to work on building my own house. I want to build a sauna first. Like that's the first thing. And I actually want to work with my hands again, lift things, put things together, like, Fuck all this writing and stuff like that. Like it's, it's good. It's useful, but you know, you need to go and use your body, use your hands, use your mind. And, and I actually think that's areas in which like outside of going and picking up a gun and going to war, like you can actually start to, you know, put these uh, virtues into place. So, so there, there's some ideas. There's obviously going to be other things, you know, maybe the need to fight will one day come up again. I don't know. Um, you know, and like, I actually opened the book with one of my favorite quotes. It's, um, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war, right? Like it's one of my absolute favorite quotes. And and that's essentially, I think a good philosophy for life is that you should prepare yourself, uh, in such a way because number one, we don't know what's going to happen. It doesn't mean you become a fucking prepper, but like being in good physical condition, using your body, knowing all of that sort of stuff, being able to fight if that was situation was going to uh, present itself will change you as a person um, and it'll, it'll make you a better person. I think. Yeah. I think as a man, I mean, it just, you feel the sense of accomplishment when you do push your body and you feel better. I mean, you feel if you're working all day on the computer and you're kind of like dragging through the day, literally just go do like a hundred pushups. This happened to me. This mm-hmm. happens to me like once or twice a week. And, and it's so, insane how just something like that just pushing your body to the limit and wow i feel great i feel accomplished and i think it's this sense of fulfillment accomplishment that's really lacking from most men's life it's all fake you know internet or sports teams that they have no direct impact on you know yeah yeah and it's true right like why you don't need to have high testosterone to you know sit on your ass all day, work in a cubicle, and yeah, even build a business like hustle culture, or whatever. You're not really like physically pushing your body, so of course, yeah, testosterone. Why? Why do you need to have you know this hormone being upregulated when you're you're not really utilizing it for kind of the ancestral purposes? So I completely agree. Totally. I think it's yeah, it's interesting, but. I think the fighting, the just physically, you know, challenging your body, um, what have you, learning how to shoot a gun or be in a stressful situation. Yeah, it can never hurt. Uh, I, I think everyone should learn how to do it. If you if you really want to be in this position, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I'm the same way. Um, constantly. I mean, I'm out here in Wyoming looking for land like all the time. So I'm, I'm ready, man. Yeah. It's, it's a struggle. <laughs> Um, even just getting on social media every day and posting just a couple of times. I'm like, ah, oh, this is nice. It, it I, is, I love man. everyone. The connection I've made has been fantastic. But if, uh, you know, if, if I had the choice, I would, yeah, build a cabin in the woods, go hunting, go hiking, and yeah, call, call it a life maybe, at least for a bit. <laughs> but Yeah, I mean, it's the, this, is, this is the challenge of modern life, right? It's like, how do you find a way? And like, I hate the word balance because I think that's just gay, but like, you know, because yeah. there's no such thing as balance, yeah. right? But um, like, it's, it's how do you find a way to, you know, master both or weave both? And, you know, it's, it's never going to be perfect. You know, it's like, you know, me recently, I, you know, I said, fuck it, I'm coming back onto Twitter and stuff like that because – I'm releasing a book um, because I want to do some more content stuff. And, you know, there, there's some things that, you know, you need to do as part of uh, this world. You, you know, you can't just write something in a void and no one's going to read it. Assuming you've got some, you know, 
commercial goals in mind, um, or you want to get a message out or something like that, you know, like, you know, I've got a family to feed that I want to like have a passive income part of why I wrote the book. Um, but I also have this message that I want to get out there. So it's like, it, like the book kind of like meets a series of needs. Uh, but you know, I, I also like, I really enjoyed writing this book because it also forced me to go out there. And like, when I was young, I was always into, like, I was doing, like I did Capoeira when I was young, I was always at the gym, like I was always doing something and, you know, it, it, it pushed me to go and join jujitsu again, which has always been like, it's always been sitting there on my to-do list. Yeah, I'll get to it. 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 And I, I did a couple of classes like a few years ago and when I went to Brazil for the first time and I just had a natural, uh, liking to it, but also natural predisposition to it. Uh, you know, like I've got this sort of latent body intelligence from, maybe I was born with it or maybe it was from doing capoeira when I was younger and stuff like that. But, um, I, I stopped jujitsu for a number of years and then, you know, we're back in Brazil now. And I was always like, for the first six months I was here, I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I just never got around to doing it. And, you know, like writing the book was part of like my own pill. I was like, man, you know, I'm telling people here to like, shut the fuck up, put the book down and go. And that's exactly what I did as I was writing that. I was like, okay, fuck it. I'm going, you know, I got up, went, signed up. And since then I'm, you know, going five times a week and it's fucking great, man. Like, you know, you, you feel different and you, and you also like, man, inside a dojo, you, you start to learn, what, you know, what is inside a dojo a hierarchy? You've got, you know, your black belts, your brown belts, your purples, your blues, you know, your, your whites and, you know, you go down and, you know, what, like when you enter the dojo, you do not shake the white belt's hand first. You go and greet the black first and then you go down to the most, uh, junior like and that is not an age thing it is a competence thing like so you know it's like in all of these traditions you know once again things like hierarchy competence all this sort of stuff pops up and they've you know lo and behold what have they done they've lasted for centuries and they still work you know this sort of modern shit like you know you, you like i can imagine a modern martial arts school it's like you know you just go and like group hug or same some color shit, like belt. some gay yeah, shit. same like, color belt yeah, exactly everyone's white <laughs> no winners like, like honestly man oh uh, it's so bad yeah participation trophies ah it, mm-hmm. it's just like that that was so ingrained i think i grew up like maybe like the last years of of where discipline and like all that stuff was yeah, you and i both. was yeah. uh kind of just valued so like tremendously and and for me i was never like the most talented athlete and i always just had to work my ass off bro so when I got to, you know, university and college and was still playing soccer, when people didn't do that, it would just drive me insane. I was like, you have all these, you know, natural abilities or, you know, more than I did and you're slacking. And yeah, if they didn't get playing time, it'd be like this whole hoorah, big deal. Wah, wah. I mean, we have 30 players on the team. Obviously, you can't all play at the same time. So like mm-hmm, get the fuck mm-hmm. over it and start working harder and maybe you get some playing time. But yeah, the respect respect is earned you know it's it's not given totally. and people need to Fuck yes. like just live their life by that and it's uh yeah jujitsu is something uh for me as well I'm, I'm trying to get into that it's hard out here in two thousand person towns but uh i'm looking for <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking for some friends or it's uh you know areas to roll in but in general i i would say it's having you know that that fortitude uh to to build upon and I, I just, I, it's funny to me because I see so many people out there, especially in the health and fitness community. They're just, they're like kind of just fraud. They're fraudulent. I mean, they don't, mm-hmm. they talk the talk, but they're kind of like 50% living the life that they say they are. And to me, I try to be the complete opposite. I mean, I give, you know, insights to my life, but it's like, I always want to putting in that proof of work and, and showing people that, you know, this is possible. This is what I do. This is what I love to do. And if you come like spend some time here, you'll see that it's way more than that because it's important. And if you don't live your life with these virtues and then you portray something on social media, I think you're just, you're just doing it the oh, wrong dude, way. That, yeah. Don't even get me started on that shit, dude. When I was in Austin, you know, I met a couple of people like that were like oh, yeah. really high profile in that space. And then fuck me. Like, you know, they're sitting there writing threads on Twitter about, you know, like abstinence and this and that. And then like on the weekend, they're sitting there trying to say, Hey, Hey bro, like, you know, there's this new drug called G it's going around. You're going to love it. I'm like, what the fuck are you fucking talking about? Oh, bro? Like, so you know, and they're like on MDMA every weekend or this and that. It's like, get the fuck out of here. Like that shit drives me crazy. And like, I mean, it's not that I like, you can go and do whatever you want, put whatever you want in your body. Like, you know, I, 
I have only like, I, the first time I ever tried any form of drug, like hands down was when I turned 30, my sister spiked my uh, <laughs> birthday cookies with weed. But that, that was how I literally, like I'd never, t- no fucking, did, I quit alcohol when I was 18. So it's been now, you know, almost 20 years, like not drinking alcohol. Um, I never touched any form of drug, no cocaine, nothing, 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 nothing. I just like skipped all of that shit. And since then, all I've done is um, I did, uh, you know, I did weed. I've done some mushrooms with like special people. Um, and I've tried MDMA once with my wife. That's it. Like nothing else. But, you know, these motherfuckers out there talking about like, you know, living holistic lives and stuff like that <laughs> on the fucking weekends, like, bro, it's just, just so much scamming out there, man. It drives me nuts. Yeah, it's rough. And you get these like health coaches that don't even have their own health in order and, uh, you know, giving mm-hmm. other people advice. But again, at the end of the day, it's it's truth, right? Bit- Bitcoin is all about truth. It. The truth will resonate. Um, it's about, you know, don't trust, like verify, like you need to vet these people out. You need to vet out their message and yeah, connecting in person or, or just, you know, following the truth is just really going to be what it's about, but also for yourself, like putting in that proof of work. But I kind of want to get to, you know, we're talking about this modern warrior culture lifestyle and, you know, obviously another, you know, modern thing that's going on that you're kind of delving into is AI, AGI and to me, it's really interesting because a lot of people, um, you know, Matt Hill is like, yeah, the robots are coming. We just need to decentralize the computing system. So we actually own them, but everyone's going to want like robot servants and that should be like a consensus want. And in general, yeah. Oh, why would we need to have, you know, physical stature and adversity? Um, but if we're going to have AI solve, solve our problems. Um, so I'm yeah. curious, you know, how you tie that in, what you're working on and yeah. For sure. I, um, so I think, you know, I've started to call AI gay. I, you know, so it's <laughs> so fucking cringe. It's like all the, all the dweebs and all the nerds, all these like, you know, disembodied, you know, brain in a vat, Yuval Harari, you know, fucking wannabes, you know, are all over the AI stuff. Like, you know, the, the recent one that made me laugh was like, you know, Peter Schiff's son, Spencer Schiff is like, uh, you know, I'm no longer interested in Bitcoin because, you know, That's right. AI is going to make everything free. And, you know, why should I have to work when AI can do everything? It's like, bro, do you even hear what you're saying? Like, but like, this is the thing. It's I, like, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, just, I don't even know where to start with this because I've got so many gripes with it. Like, um, you know, the, the big thing people are always afraid of or talking about or the big dream is like artificial general intelligence. And, you know, with, with chat GPT sort of popping up, you know, they sort of think that, Hey, you know, this may be around the corner. Like, Hey, you know, you've got this thing that can fucking talk to us and like, Hey, you know, maybe we've cracked the code for intelligence and we, you know, we're going to have AGI in the next couple of years. I call fucking bullshit, like bullshit with a capital B U L L S H I T. Like, First of all, intelligence is such a complex concept. Like when you think about what general intelligence means, you look at the human as a, as a entity, like you have, you, you not only have cognitive intelligence, which we barely fucking understand, but you have like muscle intelligence, like uh, your, your digestive intelligence, you have like intuitive intelligence, you have the intelligence of your your bones for fuck's sake, you have like the intelligence of your, your endocrine system, like th- we understand none of those, um, you know, in terms of like how they emerge and what they actually fucking mean, let alone cognitive intelligence, which is so broad. All we've done in a computational sense, you know, with machines is we have figured out through probabilities that language has patterns and so does imagery. And therefore with high amounts of compute, we can produce patterns in linguistic or visual form. This is not fucking intelligence. This is like I, I you know, did a recent uh, little article and I said like uh, AI should be changed to PP, you know, probability programs. Like that, that's essentially what we're running here. So there's like, first of all, the AGI is not around the corner. We have no fucking idea what it is. We have no idea what cognitive intelligence is or, you know, computational intelligence. So we're, we're, we're like somewhere so far back that, you know, AGI is like literally not a threat, first of all. Second of all, you know, the, the term artificial intelligence is very like loaded. It's artificial, yes. Intelligence, no. It's, it's really more probabilities more than anything else. So if we kind of scale back from there, you know, like that's the f- sort of first 
truth bomb I think, you know, that people sort of need to come to terms with. It's like it's not a runaway train where, you know, sentient computers or machines are going to run everything. So so that's that's false. Um, so then the question is like, okay, these programs, could they automate a bunch of stuff, um, you know, using probabilities like, you know, monkeys typing on a, uh, you know, you know, what that – trope is like, you know, infinite monkeys typing on keyboard to produce the Bible, right? Like, so, so if you have these, you know, these probability programs and many of them, can they automate a bunch of stuff? Sure. Um, the question then is like, how do you use them without turning yourself into a lemming, right? So it's like, you know, the brain is a muscle, um, you know, the body is a muscle, like the less you use it, the, the less, like basically you adapt to needing it less. So you can actually turn yourself into an idiot. Like I, you know, there's this AI person that was uh, popped up on my Twitter and, you know, saying like, you will be left behind if you're not using AI. It was one of those Twitter ads. I was like, no, 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 you'll actually probably still have a fucking brain in 10 years if you don't uh, depend on AI for all of your thinking, right? So there is, you know, there, there is actually going to be an opportunity. You know, I was on a spaces a little while back saying, hey, you know, if you want a real, um, if you want to get ahead in the AI space, go learn to build a house because, you know, everyone's going to be so dumb, stupid, like not using their bodies, not using their brains. They're not going to know how to do anything. So like you will be in fucking demand if you know how to use your hands and use your brain. Um, but uh, anyway, to, to sort of tie it back, I, I don't think I was going to replace um, m- maybe for the lemmings, it's going to replace a lot of their decision making, a lot of that stuff. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, though, this, this is this is the ultimate thing about humans is that we will find something else to do to fill our time with. Now, if you have outsourced your thinking, the thing that you will probably end up filling your time with is more than likely some sort of social media or Netflix or virtual, you know, voyeurism of some sort. So, you know, I think those people will end up being handled by something like that. Um, If you are using these probability programs as the tools that they are and you are liberating your own time, in a intentional way, you might open your time to go and do jujitsu, hunting, fighting, building, you know, do something like that. And that's fantastic. That is a intelligent use of uh, such tools. Um, but it doesn't mean that work is no longer going to be important, like, you know, that we're going to be living in a post abundance world that, you know, somehow, you know, the machines are going to be doing everything for us. That's, I think that's all bullshit. You know, that is like, it, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of, uh, humanity of where this technology is, what it is, what it's capable of, what it's going to do, all this sort of stuff. I think, you know, it's very easy for people to get hyperbolic, particularly when, you know, we live in the age of social media where everything becomes a hysteria where, you know, the influences of people like fucking Lex Friedman and, um, and Yuval Harari, like that shit, I fundamentally disagree with. So I, I don't know if that kind of answers, you know, what you're asking. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting. I think for sure, to me, it seems like it's just a big copycat machine. Like it's just like taking all this information and just like kind of, you know, putting that into a response or what have you. I I haven't really used it too much, Um, but Mm -hmm. it's not. Yeah. I I, I think intelligence is, is a stretch. Um, Probably. Yeah. If you're, yeah, if you don't use your, your brain for sure, you're gonna, you're gonna be, uh, not very useful in the future. I mean, we already see like this shortage of like construction workers and labor workers. Totally. It's, it's hilarious. And then um, what you're saying about, you know, what do we know? The more you learn, the more you know, you realize how little we do know. And uh, totally. I think whether that's in the health space, like anti-aging, people are like, oh, we're going to figure out aging and like Brian Johnson, some of these guys are like aging backwards. It's like, this is not, it's, so it's hilarious. I mean, it's giant science experiment. Cool. He's doing it like good for him. He's got millions of dollars to blow, but in general, he has no idea what's going on. And you, the deeper you dive, you realize you need to understand like quantum mechanics to understand health, which nobody even actually understands at the fundamental level. And there's so many gaps and yeah, the fiat system has closed off so many rabbit holes of learning. We're actually like not progressing as we did once. And um, at the end of the day, I think perhaps AI, AGI could help us better understand these topics, but we're still, we're so far away. I mean, it's just, it's kind of exciting um, for those who are on the frontiers of a lot of things uh, as we are, but at the end of the day, yeah, I don't think the robots are, are here to take our jobs and, you know, outsource everything in our lives to them um, this century. But I'm curious what, you know, you have the spirit of Satoshi that you're working on. So this is kind of what a decentralized AI that's 
the centered around Bitcoin. Maybe you could just explain that well, for a minute yeah, or so, two. Yeah, so so it's 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 not so much a decentralized AI. It's more like you know. So to come back to what I said about these things being tools. So so yes. language models are basically just the new interface, right? That that's really the breakthrough that we've had here is like there there has been a step change in quote unquote AI as a as a space, and that is as a function of these new transformer models, which are basically as I said, they're probability programs, and you know. I got caught with AI bug early on. I looked into it. I, you know, fell down that rabbit hole. But the, d- the deeper I dug, the more I realized that this is just math and probabilities. And these language models are becoming a new interface. So, so think about it this way: when the internet first came out, like if you wanted to find some information, you would have to search, right? You'd have to trawl and crawl and do all this sort of stuff. So there was a problem solved by a company called Google, and they learned how to build these bot crawlers, which went and figured out, found relevant shit for you. So it became the medium through which you understood the internet. Like how many people today go past the first page of Google? Fucking practically zero. How many even go past the first like couple suggestions? You know, they don't even scroll. Like scrolling is too hard, right? So like your model of the world becomes essentially what Google tells you. Like, you know, if Google tells you, you know, a jab is safe, you know, you're going to go and take the jab, right? So basically you you have this, like social media algorithms also do the same thing. They serve you what they believe you uh, should know or what the consensus is around, you know, your archetype. Now, language models are a new interface, essentially. It's like, why would you go and search on Google when you can go to ChatGPT and ask it a question? It'll produce an answer for you. Now, here's where the danger comes in, is that what these language models are, what's happening upstream of the language model is two things. One is they're being trained and filtered for toxic language and approved speech, essentially. So so you have this kind of like Overton window closing of like what is kosher or what's not kosher to be said. But then you've also got these like regulatory bodies that are emerging now that have decided to regulate AI because of the danger of AGI, which is a complete red herring. What they're essentially doing is they're putting bodies together to approve what is what can and should be said through a language model. Now, if you think about what that means, if everybody in the next three to five years is going to stop like using the normal Google search and stuff like that, and they're, they're, they're like it's Plato's cave. If their model of the world is going to come through what this language model is saying and the language model is like, you know, woke and approved speech, everybody's going to start thinking like that. It's like a reverse inception. It's a beautiful way to get everybody thinking the same way. So what you need to combat that is you need alternatives. So to, to sum up, you know, what we're doing is we're building an alternative language model and the kind of corpus of data we're using and the, the style and the language and the tonality we're doing is more Bitcoin centric, Austro, you know, libertarian centric, you know, more conservative type, you know, language. And that's what we're training our model on. And we're not going to be running it through a toxicity filter. In fact, we're thinking of how to like reverse engineer the toxicity filter to make it more toxic. So it can tell you to go fuck yourself if you're being an idiot or, you know, stuff like that. But like, we, we want to buck the trend. We want to zig or zag when, you know, everyone's zigging. And, um, and th- this is like how you, I mean, it's, it's always been the game, right? It's like when you don't like something, you go and build an alternative. Satoshi didn't like the fiat system. He built an alternative. You know, I don't like, modern language models, I see where they can be useful because you can get a language model to go and get you some information. But when I ask it to give me an analysis of, you know, what would Nietzsche say about, you know, what Yuval Harari said, it gives me like this, like really like apologetic, oh, you know, but you know, this and it's like, no, fuck you. I just want like, I want the raw, real shit. Um, so that's what we're going to try and we're going to try and build. And Spirit Satoshi is like a starting point because what you need to do this is you either need a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money, or you need a really good community. And, you know, we've built Spirit of Satoshi as a community project where people can go in, they can earn some sats uh, for helping us train the model. You know, they can do some, you know, we've got some proof of knowledge exercises in there where you can like answer some FUD, this and that, like how a Bitcoiner would answer questions from everything about Bitcoin to economics, to philosophy, to health, all this sort of stuff. And this is what we really want to build. It's like a based language model. So it becomes a useful fucking tool. Um so yeah, if anyone's interested in checking that out, just go spiritusatoshi.ai and sort of get involved. But yeah, that's kind of like, you know, my attempt to push back on, um, you know, what what is a clear trend um, that could become dangerous, not for the reasons people think, but for other reasons. Yeah, it's cool. We'll have to link that in the show notes, but it's cool. It's like, you know, people complain or whine about things and then you know, there's no alternative. So that's why I love talking to people like you, talking to people like Matt Hill. They're like, building real solutions, real alternatives. Mm-hmm. So that's fantastic. But 
Um, yes. So thanks so much for coming on. Where, where can people find you on Twitter? Your book is going to come out later this year, I believe. Right. So I guess give them all the, you know, locations. Sure. So I think, I think the best is just hit me up on Twitter at Svetsky writes. So like writing R I T E S. So Svetsky writes, um, hit me up on there. That's the easiest way you'll get updates about Spirit Satoshi, about the Bushido of Bitcoin, about the Bitcoin Times Energy Edition that I'm doing as well this year with a couple of cool people. Um, so yeah, loads going on, but dude, really appreciate you having me on. I wish we had a little bit more time, but yeah, fuck, it's one of those days. Yeah, no so, worries. Um, yeah, uh, but it was an awesome chat, man. Yeah, we'll have to have you back in the future. I'm really excited to read your book. I think we need more like this. The culture piece is huge. The mindset piece yeah, is man. huge. And yeah, it get, gets me fired up. So Thanks so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Decentralized Radio. We'll see you next time.